Good morning, church. What a privilege it is. To realize Joey has trusted me twice to be up here is amazing. And um, I appreciate that privilege. And what a great Sunday last week. If you missed it, you need to be here next July 4th because it was a powerful service. But get here early because every seat in this sanctuary was to capacity. Thank you, Brother Roy. What a privilege to serve alongside you. And you and Miss Betty, are, it's just a blessing to get to know you. You know, God, truly, as you look at the, the power of one, the eternal impact we have. You know, I guess every Christian, our greatest desire is to have an impact on the world. We want to have an impact. It's part of our spiritual DNA. It's a part of who we are. And yet you ask, well, me change the world? I'm barely get my five-year-old to brush his teeth. I can just barely get through Atlanta traffic without uh, losing my patience. I can just barely, barely uh, hold it together. But can you change the world? The power of one. When we begin thinking through this, this month of July, and these powerful little one-chapter books that are part of God's Word. I grew up in a small town that if you were not careful, you went through it, you looked back and said, oh, there was a town. And sometimes I think we do that in these small one-chapter books, these that are self-contained. And when you look at it, you begin to think, well, where is the power of, of one, that eternal impact we have? I love the story about um, a baggage handler. I'm sure it was at the Atlanta airport as many times we have gone through there. And the guy, you know, the, he was being very helpful, being patient, and an overworked, uh, out of control businessman, yelling at him, berating him. He simply just smiled at the man, said, it's fine, sir, it's fine. And after the guy gets on the, goes through the boarding gate, People around him said, that was amazing. How could you keep your calm? How could you even handle that guy? And he said, you know, I just bid that guy farewell as he got on, to his, on the plane to Miami and as his bags went to Portland, Oregon. <laughs> you do have power. And God's given you that power. I love the way uh, the message translates Roman 12. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You know, tucked in to these, between two other little short books, 3 John is a powerful little book. The young John who had uh, reclined at the Messiah's side the young John who had outrun Peter to the tomb, the young John who had witnessed so many miracles, this young John is now an old man. This, this aging apostle has now outlived all the other 12 apostles. He has outlived just about everyone. He's even outlived Paul at this point. John is standing here. And he begins to wonder, what, who am I? What am I doing? He has, he has witnessed the power of Pentecost. He has seen the destruction of the temple. And now this older man who's finished the, the work of John begins to write three very personal letters. And as you begin to read through 3 John, and he begins to, to look at these words that as, as he begins to say, you know, who am I? This letter, he's written it, he gives it to Demetrius to take to Gaius. Imagine you're sitting in that room 
Demetrius hands this letter to, John, to, to Gaius. And Gaius begins to read this letter. Third John. He addresses it the elder. He does, everybody knows who he is. To my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Can you imagine what Gaius is thinking right now? All the people in this crowded little room, probably no bigger than this stage, they're listening in. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Oh, I have feeling Gaius stopped right now and just let those words sink in. And the people around him said, yeah, that's, that's you, that's you. Then John goes on to say, dear friend, you're faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They've told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. And at that point, Gaius is probably thinking, you know, he's thinking of all the people he sent out over these last few, few years. And then John goes, said, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote to the church, but the, the atrophies who loves to be first, you know how hard it was to say that name. <laughs> Do not name your child the atrophies because you will cause him never to be able to find anything at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> but the the atrophies who loves to be first will not welcome us. So when I come, I, I've heard about it, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius, ah, he's well spoken of by everyone. And even by the truth itself, we also speak well of him. And you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you, the friends here. Send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Gaius closes his, rolls up the scroll. And he said, church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, these words, so simple, so direct, so pure. Oh God, we ask that you would just literally fill this, this sanctuary today. That these words, this, this little short letter would just come alive. Whatever needs, whatever place people find themselves in today, that you would just walk beside them, that you would encourage them. Lord, I don't have any words that will mean anything except what you lay upon someone's heart. And God, I pray that it will be you who's glorified this day, that it will be you who will, who will receive the honor, and it will be you that will change people's lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. As Gaius is looking at, you know, John may be uh, getting a little old in the body, but he still has the fire and the zeal for Jesus. And that's what I love about Roy. He's got that, still got that zeal for Jesus. And as I'm getting to know so many more in this church, that it's the zeal for Jesus living out their lives. And as, 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 as John has been faithful through these six decades of sharing what God means to him. And as he has been faithful to drink, this is the same John that stood at the cross and Jesus looks down, take care of my mother for me. This is the same John that uh, uh, him and his brother James put their mother up to try to position them into a position of, of influence in God's kingdom. 
This is the same John now that's going to write with the love and the passion that comes from it. When he wrote those words, this is why I write, so that people may know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's who he's about now. Phil Vischer, v- Vesker, uh, creator of Veggie, t- said, I am growing increasingly convinced that if every one of these kids burning with passion to write a Christian song or make that hit Christian movie or start that hit Christian ministry to change the world would instead focus their passion on walking with God on a daily basis, the world would change. Because the world learns about God, not by watching Christian movies, but what? by watching Christians. You are the reason the world will change. Because they're going to watch you. And the changes that will take place. And as John begins to write this, he's understood now this beautiful oneness in, in God. And that his, his faith in Christ is growing even more passionate every day. There's an old Greek proverb, and it's, I've re- seen this in other ways. It says, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. John knew he was planting trees that he would never get to sit in the shade. Tertullian, uh, early uh, church hist- historian, a century or so later, said, the pagans are amazed The pagans are amazed. They are astonished and will say, see how these Christians love one another. Are you worried about today, about the world we live in? Maybe going back to this little letter and seeing what God can do and will do when we as Christians act like Christians, when we as Christians begin to live out that faith, an eternal impact begins really with a healthy soul. Did you see what he said? I pray that you're, that you're enjoying good health, even as it is with your soul. It's amazing when you think about it. If, if someone would come to you and said, I want to pray for you, your physical health the same way, the same condition as your soul, what would it look like? If I ask that question, how is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? That's where... Gaius is listening and he begins to say you know I decided that would be an interesting question to ask Americans so the best way to know how people's condition of their soul is to look at their bank account last year uh, Americans necessity or whatever over-the-counter teeth whiteners Americans spent 1.4 billion dollars pet Halloween costumes we spent 310 million dollars Romance novels, we spent $10 billion. Chocolate, we spent $16 billion. Coffee, and that's a necessity, folks. I'm not sure I put that one in. We spent $11 billion on it. Tattoos, we spent $2.3 billion. To remove those tattoos, $66 million. (laughs) We spent... To get rid of that $16 billion of chocolate, we spent 30, 40 to $50 billion on weight loss. Then we had to spend $30 billion to put on the athletic apparel to look good because of that weight loss. Then we spent $500 million for Twinkies. And then for some of you folks, we spent $500 million in golf balls. I didn't know you could spend so much money on golf balls. But anyway, that's, that's Americans. Chinese have two characters to re- represent busyness, and they call it heart annihilation. When you begin to think of it, we live in a day where busyness is applauded. It's, 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 it's validated. It's affirmed. It's even within the churches. Busyness is becoming almost a spiritual... Uh, essence of, uh, it's almost listed in the fruit of the Spirit. Had the Holy Spirit written that, I'm sure he would have put in busyness. Not. We look at it. Steve Smith, a friend of ours, 
who does the Potter's Inn out in Colorado, wrote a book called Soul Custody. And he, he writes this, he said, caring for your soul is about waking up to live before you die. It is realizing that eternal life is not just about life in heaven. We live that life beginning right now, right here. I've got quite a few books in my bookshelves dealing with balance of life. For years, we were told you need to have balance. You need to have your work life, your, your family life, your church life, your, your, your community life, your, your leisure life. All these need to stay in balance. And you think of a circus and you see the plate spinning and the guys running back and forth trying to keep the plate spinning. And as Mark Buchanan says, that's just a myth because eventually one of those plates is gonna fall to the ground and break. There's a new word that's been, and I think is a beautiful word, called rhythm. We live life in rhythm. When you begin to think of a sustainable rhythm of life, do you realize God had a rhythm in creation? Six days, and then he rested on one. He gave them the daytime for work, the nighttime for rest. We have seasons of harvest and seasons of planting. And all that, there's a rhythm of being able to, to see life. Steve uh, went on to say, we know that the body and the soul cannot thrive when the soul is empty. Rhythm allows each person to engage, then disengage, to be involved, then withdraw, work and contribute, then rest and recover. One of my favorite writers is John Ortberg. And once he, he asked Dallas Willard, said, in one of those states, pastor of a big church, doing all these things. He asked uh, Dr. Willard, okay, what is the secret to the Christian life? He got out his book. He figured, all right, study harder, pray harder, go to church more, da, 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 da. Willard simply looked at him and said, ruthlessly, ruthlessly eradicate hurry from your life. When we begin to think of, of Gaius, it talks about even as your soul is getting along well. I don't know how Gaius managed it. In my sanctified imagination, I pictured Gaius kind of sitting and enjoying Psalm 1 and letting the waters of the stream feed his roots. I imagine him sitting in Psalm 23 in the green pastures and just enjoying that time of rest. I picture him in Psalm 100, looking into the heavens and seeing the majesty of heavens. I can imagine him being in Psalm 119 and just meditating on God's word. Gaius took the care of his soul to make sure that where he is. Contrast these two men that are listed here, Gaius and, and Diotrephes. You know, Diotrephes built a wall. Gaius built a bench. Diotrephes sold tickets. Gaius gave away tickets. Diotrephes had a balanced life. Gaius lived in rhythm. Diotrephes fed his ego. Gaius fed his soul. Diotrephes imitated what is evil. Gaius imitated what is good. Robert Benson in his little book, Constant Prayer, says, I have noticed a curious phenomenon. One of the few things that we are reluctant to make lists about and do research about and have row of boxes to tick off about are the things that have to do with our spiritual lives. I don't know why this is. We say that our spiritual life is important to us. Sometimes we'll even go so far as to say that it's the part of our lives that's the most important to us. We also say, at least we say about everything else that matters to us, that if we do not write it down, we will forget to do it. We say that if we're, we're going to make sure something is done and done well, we need to make a plan so nothing gets missed and nothing gets forgotten. The place we are least likely, the place we are least likely to make such a plan is when it comes to our spiritual lives. We would not dream of being this way about everything else. Gaius had done it right. He had taken care of his soul. So if I ask you that question later on, when you leave here, what, how is it with your soul? Are you going to be able to say, 
My soul is as good as my physical health. In fact, it's better to have an eternal impact living with a healthy soul. So uh, then how do we have an eternal impact? John goes on to say, you are walking in truth. You continue to walk in it. St. Augustine said, when we regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. A.W. Tozer says, the unattended garden will soon be overrun with weeds. He's been to my house lately. The heart that fails to cultivate truth and root out error will shortly be a theological wilderness. And Winston Churchill said, men occasionally stumble over the truth but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. Gaius is listening. And I have a feeling that little room full of people are saying, he does walk in truth. He's, he's a man of truth. He lives his life by truth. Now, I found this very interesting. Robert Thornton uh, is a professor at Lehigh University. In this day and age where everyone and everything is getting sued or someone's talking about it, he's come up with a list of virtually litigation-proof phrases called the lexicon of intentionally ambiguous recommendation. Or the acronym, if you write that down, is LIAR. So if you don't want to get, if you're an employer and you don't want to get sued, these are some of the things. To describe an inept person, I enthusiastically recommend this candidate with no qualifications whatsoever. To describe an ex-employee who had problems getting along with fellow workers, I am pleased to say that this candidate is a former colleague of mine. To describe an unproductive candidate, I can assure you that no person would be better for the job. To describe an applicant not worth consideration, I would urge you to waste no time in making this candidate an offer of employment. I can imagine John closing his eyes as he, as he reads this and dictates that line, I was overjoyed when some, when some of the friends arrived and testified to your faithfulness, to the truth, namely how you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Then I have a feeling a frown came across his face. He looked over at Demetrius. See, I'm taking it, Demetrius is the one who carries this letter. And as he looks at Demetrius, he says, be sure, be sure, and take that box of old WWJD bracelets to and give them to that other guy in this letter because he needs to know what it means to walk in truth. John listens and he remembers those verses that he's, he's just penned under the inspiration of God. He said, worship the Father in spirit and truth and the truth will set you free to you from the Father, the spirit of truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And in that final entry that John wrote, Pilate asked him, what is truth? What is truth? Communities of people who love truth live faithfully and respond gratefully gratefully are rare, but they embody much of what the church is called to be and do. I have a feeling John remembers those first communities of believers in Acts 2 through 4. Sometime read through there. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that what you would love for the church to look like today? Where they're breaking bread daily, where they're fellowshipping together, where they're going into the homes and they're sharing meals together. And it talks about that there's the bold preaching that's taking place and the fervent prayers. And I love that one verse, and God is adding to their numbers daily. And I believe as John is writing this letter, he's reflecting back on to those early days. And he's beginning to see, this is what church is all about. This is what Jesus is all about. He's calling us and, and you, 
you gay us, you're continuing to walk in that. You're still continuing to be there together. Then deception and lying in Acts 2, or Acts, I think, 4. And Ananias and Sapphira comes. And they lie. And they tell the church, I've sold this property and I'm bringing all this money to you. Deception wasn't, they were positioning themselves for power, for influence, to try to be the model givers. But as Lewis uh, Smead writes, he said, the lie that Ananias and Sapphira told to the Holy Spirit and the community was dreadful because it broke the bond of unity in the new creation. You know, we live in an age where it's so easy to spin stories. We've just gone through an election. My goodness, can you spin stories faster than what was being spun these last few months? We live in an age when you can, you can Twitter, you can tweet, and you can send it out so quickly, and it doesn't even have to resemble truth. And I, you sometimes wonder what John would have written to the church today. And you begin to see, you know, we can, we live, I said earlier, we got our work me, and we've got our church me, and we've got our, our going home at night me. And we can look different in each one of those situations. And when you begin to look at it, looking at the values and looking at where we are and that deception that crept into that early church, how easy it is to creep into the body of Christ. And when we are not living in that truthfulness as we're walking and to be able to, to share and say, you are continuing. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. We live where flattery, dishonesty, lying, self-deception, ego build, anything, power hunger, are all deformations of truthfulness. Christine Poe, in her little book, Living Into Community, said, living truthfully in contemporary society is difficult on many levels. But as Christians, we are called to it. And then, as John gets on towards the end of the letter, that eternal impact, living to bless others. John commends Gaius and condemns Diotrephes for probably one of the most ordinary activities of the day, hospitality. Gaius understood the power of opening one's home and to, to welcome people in. Diotrephes understood the power of control and selfishness. Welcome is one of the signs that a community is alive. To invite others to live with us is a sign that we aren't afraid, that we have a treasure of truth and of peace to share. The early church community knew hospitality was at the very heart of the Christian life. They, they practiced hospitality, not just to, to, to have people in, but they knew the power of it. And when you begin to see that hospitality is that vital act of responding to God's grace and reflecting on God's graciousness, Hospitality is the way we respond that allows people to come in. You know, somehow hospitality in the last few years or last several centuries has probably lost some of its power. Now we think of a segment of the travel industry or we think of a nice dinner party or we think of, of, of difficult conversations that you're trying to have in home. And if you look at a hospitality in those ways, it can be just difficult. The little girl who's watching her mother frantically get the house in order and running about and trying to pick up things. Finally, the little girl looks at her mother in exasperation and says, Mom, you're trying to make this place look like there's no children living here. And sometimes stress comes because we're trying to make something that was never intended. Hospitality, there are practical limits. I love this Swahili proverb that says, treat your guest as a guest for two days. On the third day, give them a hoe. There is practical limits to hospitality. So you allow those guests to come in, but you have to be careful sometimes. Henry Nouwen writes, and I think captures it well, is if there is any concept worth restoring to its original depth and evocative potential, it is the concept of hospitality. Pretty obvious, hospital and, and hospitality share a common word. Hospitality, 
is caring for one's soul. Hospital is caring for one's physical needs, but both of them mesh together in a beautiful way. And when you begin to think of, of that, uh, of living and being able to, to bring healing, to restore, to renew, that is the concept of hospitality. It's not about a nice meal, though that's there. It's not about a safe place that someone can come, it's that. But it's about bringing people in and restoring them, to re renew them, to send them on their way, just like Gaius is commended, send them out even stronger for Jesus. The end goal of hospitality is care and healing. We do the caring and Jesus does the healing. I love that phrase. When you view hospitality as entertainment, the house will never be ready. But if you view hospitality as a ministry, the house becomes a sanctuary. And you begin to look at the, what are you wanting hospitality to be? And you think, and I love the fact that some of the, the newer pastors, J.D. Greer uh, from the Summit Church writes that hospitality is a power so explosive that it truly can change the world. The writers of The Simplest Way to Change the World writes, the secret weapon for gospel advancement is hospitality. And you can practice it whether you live in a house, an apartment, a dorm, or a high rise. You know, just because 3rd John was written centuries ago, the truth, the power, the meaning of it shows the relevancy as God inspired these words. They're relevant for us today in a day when we live in isolation, when we live apart from each other, when we are needing people more than we've ever had it before. And you begin to see the church responding could we be on the verge of the greatest revival in time? I think we can be. And you look at a world that is desperate. There are four things that I would see as we look at the, the spiritual practices of hospitality. Hospitality impacts spiritual life. Martin Luther once said, he relished conversation at meals for discourses are the real condiments of food if they are seasoned with salt. For word is wedded by word. Not only is the belly fed with food, but the heart is also fed with doctrine. Hospitality in, impacts spiritual counsel. Going back over to those verses in Acts 2, it talks about day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. We have pastoral care now, we need it. We have spiritual uh, counselors, we need them. But you know, there was a time when the spiritual council was walking into your mom's house and she had a pot of coffee on. And she just poured a cup of coffee and you shared the concerns of the day. There was a time when you just walked to the feed store or to the drug store and you just talked to the people around and they were the spiritual council. Counseling, yeah, we need it. But returning to that hospitality as you begin to see not just going in, but to engage people into life. People could just stop by and imagine that wise woman simply gave a cup of coffee and that person left, renewed, restored, refreshed. Hospitality impacts worship. Acts 2.47 says, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people the home became a place of worship and prayer times. When Connie and I were first, every missionary makes mistakes when they go. So we, we, we started, a, had a small church meeting in our home. We had, we'd brought Connie's piano with us. And so the they, churches didn't use pianos. They wanted to sing with a piano. Oh, mercy, was that not a good move? But worship did take place after we closed the keyboard and allowed the music of the Spirit to work through their lives. Prayer took place. Worship in the home, impacting. And then worship impacts outreach. Continuing in those verses in, in Acts, it says, and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I love this story of there's a congregation out in Los Angeles. And he's, the pastor of this multi-ethnic congregation says, you know, the front door of the home is the side door 
of the church. As we seek to nurture people in the Christian faith, home-based hospitality becomes a rich practice. This letter, oh, as, as Gaius read it again and again, as, as we read it today in Peachtree City, Georgia, the same desire is that I would ask of you, is it well with your soul today? Are you walking in truth? Are you sharing God's love through hospitality? Hospitality in the way of being there, of going to wherever it is to, to, to be there. The power of one will have, does have, can have eternal impact. When we together, one by one by one, we make a difference. There, the, I love this illustration I found this week. It says the Greeks had a race in their Olympic games that was unique. The winner was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. You know what? I want to run all the way with my torch lit. I may not win the race, but I can run the race with the, with the torch still lit. Great sermons, you get those other Sundays. Today, you just get me. Great preaching, those will be used by God. They're going to teach you. They're going to convict you. They're going to motivate you. But just as equally important, healthy souls will be used by God to restore you, to refresh you, for you to use an eternal impact. Walking in the truth will be used of God to maintain your integrity and witness. Great homes, great hospitality will be used by God to restore you, to heal you, to feed you as you impact the needy world around you. This series of Power of One, living out of a healthy soul, walking in truth, sharing hospitality with the world around you. I don't know where you are today. I don't know exactly what your needs. One of the things that this church does offer is an opportunity of invitation. Sometimes it's simply coming and praying. Sometimes it's just turning to your neighbor and saying, I've got this need. Would you pray with me? And I would love to give you the freedom today. If you've got a particular need that you're facing, not to be afraid of making noise, but just to turn around to someone and say, I've got a doctor's appointment this week. Can you pray with me real quick? I've been looking for a job. Can you pray with me this week? Joey, myself, others will be available here if you wanna come and, and pray with us and say, I've got those needs. Can you do it? Maybe you've been searching for a church home. This is a great church. You know, Joey said something to me this last week, said, I would never be a pastor of a church that I didn't enjoy being a member of that church. And that's the way it is with me here. This is a great church. God's brought us together for this time. So as we do the invitation, as the... Um, the so music is playing, the, as you're singing. I would invite whatever those needs, and maybe you just need to sit for a few minutes. Maybe for the first time, it's quiet. If you've got children at home, you bless, you, you bless those few minutes that you can have. And maybe you just want to say, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here. And maybe some of you are parents or grandparents and you know that you need to be praying for your children or your grandchildren. Take that time now to do it. The, the music is gonna be playing. The song, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I guess that's the one. What a beautiful way to end. As you stand, as you sing, whatever that need is, we as a church would welcome you. But take the time, if you need to, turn around to someone and say, can you pray with me? Or we're here. If you want to say, I want to join this church, then that opportunity to say, for the first time, I would love to know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That would be the greatest gift that we could give you today.